Hello everyone and welcome back. In today's video we've got a couple of things to discuss including a few signings, an update on the Matt Murray situation, and some trade rumors involving the Carolina Hurricanes, the Buffalo Sabres, and the LA Kings. And we'll get to all of that coming up right now. Hello everyone, welcome back to another video here at the N10 Talking Channel. Now, as usual, we'll kick things off today with a couple of signs that have happened over the past couple of days. Now, contrary to what has happened over the past couple of videos, we actually have a decent amount of signs that have happened. Uh, over the last two, maybe three videos, there's only been a handful of signings over the past few days. Uh, but today we do have a couple of decent signings. So we have four entry-level contracts, one player who was an RFA who got his new deal, and then two contract extensions that will begin at the start of next year. So we'll start with the ELCs first. Uh, first with the Colorado Avalanche. They signed right winger Nikolai Kovalenko to a two-year ELC with AAV of $896,000. So a decent signing there. Uh, Kovalenko is... Looks like at least a really good Avalanche player. He was a sixth round pick all the way back in 2018, so he definitely has been uh, waiting in the wings for an NHL opportunity for a while now. He's been playing over in the KHL. He's done quite well. So I definitely like this deal for Kovalenko. A lot of people think he could be an earlier version of Kuzmenko and a little bit better than him. So once again, Kuzmenko came over last year at the age of 27 from the KHL, went to Vancouver, and he had a fantastic season. So if Kovalenko can come over in the next year or two from the KHL, uh, play in the NHL over the next little while, and show that he can be an, a really good player like Kuzmenko, maybe he can be like a solid 20-25 goal scorer for the Avalanche. And I think with the amount of players that they have on that team and the fact that they're pretty cap strapped right now if they can get him over there in like maybe next year or the year after that would be a fantastic addition for the avalanche so it's a solid deal in my opinion not sure if he'll go and turn pro this year or next year but i definitely like this deal for kovalenko and if he can show that he's a really good player maybe he can be kuzmenko 2.0 so definitely, I really like this deal for the Avalanche. And even though they've had to wait for a while to get him to uh, sign his ELC, given the fact he was a 2018 draft pick, they are at least able to get him signed. So a really good sign there for the Avalanche. Uh, the Philadelphia Flyers signed 2022 seventh round pick Alexis Gendron to a three-year ELC with an AAV of Andrew $60,000. Really good for Gendron. It was a 7th round pick of this past year, so once again, you don't usually see too many 6th or 7th round picks uh, get signed really that close after their draft year, so a really good signing there for Gendron. Uh, he looks like he could be eventually a really good maybe 3rd line right winger for the Philadelphia Flyers. Still going to need some more time in development. He's playing over in the QMJHL right now, so once again, he had a fantastic season last year. He should hopefully to continue to build on it. Probably needs at least one, if not two more, seasons over in juniors. Probably would also need a year in the minors, but I think in time, Gendron could definitely challenge for like a third or fourth line right wing role in Philadelphia. So I think that's a really, really good signing for the Flyers, and I think that ELC will be really good. Uh, the Chicago Blackhawks also sent one of their 2022 th picks, signing third round selection Samuel Savoy. To a three-year ELC with AAV of Andrew $78,000. Uh, Savoy was a really decent pick in the 2022 draft. Uh, really Had a really good season last year in the QMJHL. And he did fantastic with Gatineau. So I definitely like that signing by the Hawks. Uh, once again, same sort of thing as Gendron. Probably only another year in the juniors. Then another year in minors. But two to three years, I could definitely see Savoy challenge for like a second or third line role with the Hawks. I think eventually he could be a solid third, maybe second line left winger for the Hawks. So that's a definitely a solid signing there for the Hawks to get Savoy signed uh, for the next couple of years. The Calgary Flames signed Samuel Honjik, who was the 16th overall pick in this most recent draft, to a three-year ELC with AAV of $950,000. Now Honjik was not overly shocking that he went 16th. I was expecting to go a little bit lower than that, but he's a solid player. He's a really good left winger. He should fit in really well in Calgary long term. Probably going to need to stay in juniors this year, 
then probably going to go for a year uh, in the AHL. But I think in time, Hanji could definitely challenge for like a top middle six, maybe even top six role with the Calgary Flames. And I think long term, he should have some pretty good success with the Calgary Flames. And I really, really like Hanji as a player, and he looks like a really, really good prospect. And I think the Calgary Flames made the right choice at the draft just under a month ago. So definitely, that's a really good sign there to get their first round pick from this past year locked up. And hopefully he can continue to build his game and eventually be a solid NHL forward for the Flames. So that's a really good sign there for the Flames. That's all four ELC signings. Uh, the one RFA that did get signed was Ben Mayers. Mayers signed a one-year, one-way, $775,000 deal with the Colorado Avalanche to remain there. Uh, he's definitely a solid player. Uh, he, he came over from college a couple of years ago. Got his first taste of pro season that last year. Uh, was mostly I think in the AHL but he did get a couple of NHL games of opportunity looked really good with the Avalanche's team where it's at right now I would not be shocked if he was able to make the NHL roster this upcoming season as maybe like a fourth line center or fourth line left winger so I definitely do like the signing of Myers and I definitely think that will be a extremely good pick for the Avalanche uh, if you look at some of the extensions because there are two other signings both were contract extensions that will begin at the start of next year uh, first with the Florida Panthers they sent E2 Luo Strainen to a three-year contract extension with an AV of three million dollars so he's currently on the last year of his deal at a one and a half million dollar cap it so he gets a one and a half million dollar raise that's a really good signing for Luo Strainen uh, after being acquired in the Vincent Trocek deal a couple of years ago, Lil Strain finally has a real breakout season this year. Really helped in that middle six with the Panthers, especially. And the Panthers didn't have a very strong enough forward group this past year. Lil Strain did fantastic. So I definitely think he's really worth the $3 million cap it. Uh, he's definitely worked at it, and he's definitely earned that contract extension. So in my opinion, I think he continues to be a solid middle six forward. Uh, I could see him continue to be a good third line player. It would not shock me at all if with the departure of Duclair, he was able to maybe make the second line this upcoming season, maybe playing with guys like Kachuk or Barkov. So I definitely do like his chances to maybe make that sort of a move into the top six. So definitely, I, I like Lil Strainen. He's definitely a really good young player, and I think he's going to be worth the $3 million cap hits on his new contract extension. So this is definitely a solid deal for the Florida Panthers to get a good young player locked up for the next couple of years. And then the big one, as we talked about before, uh, when we were talking about all those videos before the free agency hit, we knew that there was a lot of talk about some contract extensions. We know there was some talk about Stamkos, Matthews, Darlene, and a couple of other guys. And one of the guys we were talking about was Sebastian Ajo. We said that the Carolina Hurricanes had talked about an extension with Ajo. It sounded like there was some good progress there, but it was sort of on the back burner with a D'Angelo trade now signing. Uh, with Carlson possibly being dealt to them, Tarasenko being interested in going to Carolina, possibly moving Pesci and Teravain in. There was a lot of other business going on for the Hurricanes, so they never really got around to actually making the move. But yesterday they did. They were able to sign Sebastian Ajo to a eight-year contract extension with an AAV of $9.75 million. So that's a really massive contract extension for Sebastian Ajo. I think that is a really good contract extension. Now, I've seen a couple of people say this is a little bit of an overpayment, and you know what? I do think it is a little bit of an overpayment. When I was just thinking about Sebastian Ajo extension, I was thinking it'd be closer to $9 million on an AAV, maybe somewhere just under $9 million or just over, like maybe 9, 9.15, somewhere around there. But you also have to think about this. Next year's free agent crop is going to have the ability to do what some of these other uh, free agent crops over the past couple of years haven't been able to do, and that is get more money. Uh, the cap's going to go up most likely for, if not five or six million dollars next year, uh, because all the revenues now have been paid off for the players, so the cap's going to go up exponentially next year. And this is probably going to be the best uh, time for some of these guys to get new deals since the 2019 free agent crop had because in the 2020 uh, free agent crop, it was just after COVID. The 2021 free agent crop it was just after the shortened season. Both those seasons uh, were at 81.5 million. Uh, two years ago, the cap went up to 82.5. This past year, went up to 83.5. So over the past four seasons, we've only had a $2 million cap increase. So we're about to have a $4 million cap increase, which is more than the past four years combined. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities for some of these players to get bigger extensions. 
And if Ajo had hit the open market this upcoming season, after this year in free agency, next offseason, I think there was a significant chance you would have been able to get 10, maybe even north of 10, on the open market from another team who was dead in desperate need of a top line center. Ajo's a really good top line center, so as much as it's a little bit of an overpayment, I think Ajo is definitely worth $9.75 million, and I do think that if he had gone to free agency, he would have gone north of $10 million. So it's a really good deal for the Canes. I know Ajo only has the 180 point season, but if he can continue to do really well, maybe continue to hit 70, 80, maybe even a 90 point season over the next little while, I don't think it'll be that much of an overpayment. And once again, Ajo's a really good top line center, so I don't think it's that much of an overpayment, period. So once again, really good sign there. They get Ajo extended long term, so they don't risk losing him via free agency next year, and he should remain in that top line center with guys like Svechnikov and Jarvis on that top six for years to come. So, once again, a little bit of an overpayment, but given the fact of what Ajo could have possibly gotten on the free agent market next year, I think it was definitely a smart move for the Canes to lock him up long term at this price range. So definitely a really solid sign there for the Canes and Ajo. Next we go over here to a Matt Murray update. Now, there was a lot of talk uh, over the past couple of days that Matt Murray could be a bio candidate, could Matt Murray be injured? There's a lot of talk about how the Leafs are going to maneuver around the cap situation. Well, j around the same time that the Ajo extension was announced yesterday, there was also an announcement from the Maple Leafs that are saying that the Maple Leafs are going to be placing Matt Murray on long-term injury reserve, and he will be out indefinitely, and possibly for the rest of the season. So, definitely, it's really, really surprising, given the fact that he was back up towards the end of the playoff run for the Leafs. So definitely, but we don't know exactly if there was some sort of re-aggravation. We know Matt Murray has a ton of injury history in his career. So given the fact he's injured, I don't think it's a surprise. It's a little bit weird given the fact he was the backup in the playoffs. But I definitely don't disagree with the fact that Murray is probably injured. Given the fact that he's been injured basically his entire career, he was injured at some point in Pittsburgh. He was really injured in his time in Ottawa. And he showed this year he's really injured in Toronto. So I'm not surprised that he's injured. And he will be on long-term injury reserve for most likely the entire season. Uh, definitely. Really, really interesting uh, situation there in Toronto. But they can now put Murray on long-term injury reserve. And they can put Muzzin on long-term injury reserve. That gives them over $10 million in cap relief for this upcoming season, so that really does help them, but they're still $2 million over, so they're still gonna have to make some other move. I've seen some people say they should probably move Brody, or either trade or buy out him. Uh, I don't really see Brody being moved. I think there's definitely a possibility, given the fact that he does save them a lot of cap if they were to buy him out or possibly trade him, but he's a solid top for the defenseman, and that defense really goes down if he gets traded or moved. So unless they're going to bring in a really good replacement, I don't see them moving Brody. As for the other option, they could also move down or trade Lafferty and Timmins, which could be both buried in the minors or could both be traded. So that, there's a couple of options there for the Leafs to possibly gain some cap space and become cap compliant. But a big problem was the Matt Murray situation, and it seems like that has some clarity at this point in time. And Murray seems like he's going to be injured for the next little while. So really interesting situation, but I'm definitely not going to argue that Murray's probably injured. And I hope Murray can recover and get back playing hockey. But for right now, it seems like Murray is going to be a long-term injury reserve. So some really interesting news there. Just a quick buyout update for some of these teams. Uh, the Kraken's buyout window is closed, so they didn't buy out anyone. So, I, like I said, two surprised that Seattle didn't buy out anyone. I thought they could have bought out Wenberg. So I'm a little bit surprised that that didn't happen, but I'm not overly surprised that they didn't buy out anyone. Uh, like I said, Wenberg was really the only one. Uh, tomorrow is the last day that the Hawks and the Leafs can buy out anyone. So it'll be interesting to see if anyone's placed on... Uh, waivers to be bought out today or tomorrow. Like I said, Brody's really now the only option for the Leafs. Uh, with Murray now being injured, he can't be bought out. So, once again, they buy up Brody. They save $5 million for this upcoming season. I think it's really the only uh, possibility that the Leafs have to use the buyout window. So, I wouldn't be shocked if they did wind up buying him out. But given the fact Brody's a really big part of that top four on the defensive end, I would not be too shocked if Brody remained on the team. So definitely a solid uh, possibility there for the Leafs. Like I said with the Hawks, Johnson, Zaitsev, the really only the two possible bio candidates for the Hawks. And given that they have the most cap space out of any of those teams right now, I would not be too shocked if they kept Johnson and Zaitsev under contract for this upcoming season. So 
Definitely interesting to see, but I don't expect too many more buyouts over the next little while. We do have the uh, arbitration hearings at this point in time for, scheduled for Sunday uh, between Swayman and the Bruins and McBain and the Coyotes. So it'll be interesting to see if those two wind up going to arbitration or if they get sell before. But it doesn't seem like any of the teams currently on the buyout window will most likely buy out anyone more. So going to be interesting to see, but I don't expect the Hawks and probably not even the Maple Leafs to make any more buyouts during this current buyout window for the Leafs and the Hawks. And lastly, here we go over to the trade rumor part of the video. Uh, we've got a couple of things to talk about here today. Uh, first, with the Buffalo Sabres, a couple of days ago, there was a report out from one of the athletic riders talking about some options the Buffalo Sabres have as possible trade candidates. And he listed a couple of guys who could be trade candidates as of right now for the Buffalo Sabres. He listed Victor Olofsson, Henry Yoki Haru, Ilya Bushkin, Riley Stillman, Ukapeka Lukanen, or uh, Eric Comrie as possible trade options for the Buffalo Sabres. So that's a lot of possible options. Uh, we've heard about Victor Olofsson all throughout the offseason about him being a possible trade option for the Buffalo Sabres. I, I wouldn't still be surprised if Olofsson was moved, if, if not before the season starts and sometime before maybe the trade deadline, maybe to free up some cap space for them to go after something else. Uh, Olofsson's a really good third, maybe second line winger, but on Buffalo is more of a bomb six winger, so it'll be definitely interesting to see if Olofsson does get traded. Uh, as for the defensemen, they just brought in Clifton, they just brought in Eric Johnson, they still have Jacob Bryson, they had their three top defensemen in Power, Dolly, and Samuelson. That's basically their top six. So with those guys all still there, I do wonder if the Buffalo Sabres may have to move down uh, via waivers, one of Ilya Bushkin or Riley Stillman. I do wonder if that's a possibility that the Sabres may have to consider. Uh, Leah Bushkin's a solid third pair defenseman. Stillman's a good sixth, seventh defenseman. So it would not surprise me at all if the Sabres, given their deep, deep defense right now, were to consider maybe moving one of them before the season starts. I think that's a possibility. I really do wonder if the Sabres consider to move one of those two. Both are entering the final year of their contracts. So, once again, I will, for a team who's looking for a third pair of defense, and I could see them have some interest in Leah Bushkin or Stillman. Uh, on top of those two, he also listed Henry Yoki Haru, uh, stating that he's probably the guy with the most trade value right now. They could move him in a big package uh, to get a solid upgrade on the defensive end. I've already said that before. If they were going to get the upgrade, whether it be a guy like Noah Hannafin or a Brett Pesci or maybe a Tyler Myers, they would have to move out a guy like a Yoki Haru, who's a really good top four young right shot defenseman. But if they're able to move him out and get a top four right shot defenseman or a top four defenseman in general who can really help that team and is more of a veteran, I think they would try and do that. So definitely Yoki Haru could be a guy. I, once again, I see him only moving if they can get a good defensive upgrade. But Yoki Haru is definitely a guy who I could see being moved. And then one of Pekalukunen or Comrie, especially if he was able to get them a goalie upgrade. We know that they've been linked to guys like Hellebuck and Gibson. I could still see him go after a guy like Vladar, and they could try and move a goalie in return. So, once again, it would not surprise me at all if they started the season with Levi and Lukanen in the uh, net, and maybe Comrie as their third stringer in the AHL. But also not surprise me too much if the uh, Sabres were to move one of those two to try and get an upgrade goal to get a good tandem goalie to play with Levi. So, going to be interesting to see, but I definitely do agree with him. These are probably prime trade candidates for the Buffalo Sabres. Olofsson, solid uh, bottom sticks forward, who I think could be looking for more of an opportunity. Uh, they could keep him with the injury to Jack Quinn, but I do think there's a possibility he moves. Uh, with the Thunder defense, they have Stillman, Leobushkin, who I think could be good trade options. If they can get a solid defensive upgrade, I could see him move out Yoki Haru. And if they can get a solid goalie upgrade, I could see him move out one of Lukanen or Comrie. So definitely be interested to see, but I definitely do think that the Sabres are not completely done. It would not surprise me at all if the Sabres were to add a defenseman or a goaltender before the season was able to get underway. So, once again, not surprising, and I would not be too shocked if the Sabres were to move at least one, if not two, of these guys that he mentions uh, before the season starts. As for the LA Kings, there's a lot of talk right now that I've seen from a couple of uh, sources saying that while the Kings are not shopping these three players right now, there's a really good possibility that the Kings could move 
one or a couple of these players without hesitation, uh, either before the season starts or in season, to gain themselves some cap flexibility and to give some more roster spots to some of their younger players. So, uh, once again, I think this report started from a Hockey Now writer. It listed three players as uh, possible options for the LA Kings to trade at some point. He listed Trevor Moore, Matt Roy, and Victor Arvidsson as possible trade options for the LA Kings. He said that the, the Kings are not actively shopping these players, but he also did say that these guys will be easy to move uh, should the Kings need uh, to move these guys. So I think it's very unlikely that Moore or Roy wind up getting dealt at some point. Moore's in the first year of a five-year contract extension. They really like what he brings, and he's a solid top six swinger. So, once again, they, they saw fit enough that they liked him to extend him. So, I don't expect them to trade him. I know he takes up a good, solid amount of cap at $4.125 million, but he's still a solid right winger. So, I would be quite shocked if the Kings were to move him at some point this offseason. Uh, but the other two are both entering the final year of their deals. Roy has a three... $0.1 million cap at entering the final year of his deal. I think Arvidsson has a 3.3 or $4.3 million cap at he's entering the final year of his deal. So it would not surprise me at all if maybe Arvidsson was dealt. The Kings have a ton, and I mean a ton, of good young prospects. They have guys like Turcotte and Madden and Thomas and Fagimo in the minors. And they even have a couple of guys like Kaliev and Grundstrom, who are good top nine forwards, who are basically... Uh, sentenced to the fourth line because of their depth. So if they don't feel like they're going to extend Arvidsson or they don't feel they can afford to extend Arvidsson, it would not be shocking if they did wind up moving the Kings forward. Uh, maybe before the season starts, there was a lot of talk throughout the offseason that he could have been a cap casualty because of the Kings being so tight against the cap. They wound up moving guys like Walker, Peterson, Dursey, I have followed before they moved Arvidsson. But if they think that guys like Kaliev or Fagimo, or some of these wingers who could step up in their lineup are really ready to take the next step in the NHL. It would not shock me at all if the Kings at least considered moving Arvidsson. Uh, for Roy, I think there's also a possibility he gets possibly dealt, but the Kings moved out quite a few defensemen, guys like Walker and Jersey. Uh, they don't really have the best of decors, in my opinion. They could definitely have a guy like Clark and Bjornfoot be... Uh, in their top six this year, which are two good young defensemen. But I think they still need some more veterans with that team. Uh, they have Gavrikov, they have Anderson, they have Doughty. I think they should probably most likely try and keep Roy because he's a really good, solid veteran. And maybe playing with a guy like Bjornfra on the third pair is a solid option for them. So it would not shock me at all if Arvidsson was dealt at some point, whether it be in season or before the season starts. But I would be quite shocked if they did wind up moving guys like Matt Roy or Trevor Moore. So it's going to be interesting to see, but definitely, I do think that these guys would not be overly hard to move if the Kings were wanting to move them, but I think really, besides Arvidsson, I don't really see any of those Kings guys be moved. So going to be interesting to see, but I definitely do think that Arvidsson would be the most likely of the trade candidates here. And lastly, here we go over to the Carolina Hurricanes. Now, as we talked about Earlier in the video, Ajo just inked his long-term eight-year extension. And when the Hurricanes GM was talking about this, he said they're not close on any of their other UFAs. So it sounds like they're not close on some of their major UFAs. The three major UFAs that they have right now that are not extended are Tivo Teravainen, Brady Shea, and Brett Pesci. Now, Shea, I think, no matter what happens, I think he stays with the team past this year. Shea's a really good player. He's been a top four defenseman over the past couple of years. But the Carolina Hurricanes signed Orlov this offseason. So if the Hurricanes they keep Shea as like a third line uh, left shot defenseman or a second line left shot defenseman, if they aren't able to keep Shea beyond this year, then I heavily think that they lose Shea and Orlov's the replacement in the top four. So it's not really that bad of a deal for them. And they have a strong left side for this upcoming season. So I would not be too shocked if they went into the season without Shea being signed and maybe even past the deadline because I don't think they're really overly concerned about losing him. Uh, as for Pesci and Teravainen, I think there's a really strong chance that one or both of them could be moved, and could maybe be moved to help them acquire a lethal scoring forward that they really need in that lineup. Uh, for Pesci, contract talks have not gone well. He has just over $4 million cap it on his current deal. Uh, it sounds like he wants a pretty significant raise, and the Canes don't want to go that high. Uh, like I said, they're most likely out on Carlson right now, especially after the extension with Alho and the signing of D'Angelo. 
So I don't expect them to go after Carlson. But once again, uh, they brought in D'Angelo to be on the second pair. They still have Burns who can play on the first pair. So I definitely think those are the one-two punch there. Uh, they still have a couple of decent right shot defensemen in Jalen Chatfield and Dylan Coughlin, who both did pretty good last year as good third pair defensemen. So they have a really deep right side. So I would not be too shocked if the team with contract negotiations not going too well were to move on for Brett Pesci. So if they could move Brett Pesci, uh, they do have $2 million in cap space. So if they were to move Pesci to a team for a solid uh, top six winger or second line center who can really help them offensively this upcoming season, I think they would do it. Uh, I would definitely think they would do it. There's also a lot of talk that Tara Vining could be moved. He has a $5.4 million cap hit. And there's a lot of talk that with Jarvis most likely being a top six for this upcoming season, Bunting being brought in in the offseason as well, Tara Vining's role on that team has most likely dropped a little bit. So it does seem a little bit likely that the Canes could move Tara Vining as well. So I would not be too shocked if Pesci especially, but maybe even Tara Vinen were moved in a trade package, maybe with a couple of other things, uh, to a team to get a solid top six player who can really help their, round out their team. I know there have been a little bit of speculation linking them to a guy like William Nylander in the past. I were to wonder if the Leafs do have to consider trading Nylander at some point in time. They do consider moving him to Carolina for a guy like Brett Pesci. I think that would be a possibility. I think Nylander could be a really good goal scorer. Uh, if they're looking for a second line center, maybe they look for Mark Shifley in Winnipeg or Evgeny Kuznetsov in Washington. I think those could be some really good, solid second-line center options for the Hurricanes. And there's probably a couple of other options out there for possible options that they could look to to try and improve their top six. But I would not be too shocked if with the still having $2 million in the cap space, possibly moving out a guy like Pesci or Tara Vine, who are in the final year of their deals, if they were able to clear enough cap space to go after a solid second-line center or top six winger to improve that team. So once again, I definitely do think Pesci is a strong candidate to be moved before the season starts. Uh, once again, like I said, Pesci most likely would be third line right the shot defenseman right now, and I don't think that the Canes want to box out Chatfield or Coughlin from the uh, right side. So I definitely do think there's a really likely possibility that Pesci's moved. Maybe Terry Vines also moved as well. And if one of those two guys are moved, I definitely do think that they could use those guys as trade bait to try and improve their top six. So definitely interested to see, but that's all I'm going to talk about here today. Love to hear what you think down in the comments. Uh, what do you think about Murray being placed in long-term injury reserve? Uh, like I said, I'm a little bit surprised that he was, given the fact that they said he was healthy and he backed up in the playoffs. But I'm not shocked if Murray is actually injured. So, I, once again, I'm not questioning Murray is injured. He's had a long history of being injured, and I would not be too shocked if he was injured. So, definitely, I, I'm not shocked he is going to be placed in long-term injury reserve. Uh, what do you think about Buffalo? Is there a possibility one of those guys gets moved? Uh, could Olofsson be moved? Could Luke be moved? Could Yoki Haru be moved? Could Leah Bush can be moved? I think there's a very likely option that one of these guys is moved before the season starts. Uh, for the Kings, do you see any of those three po guys possibly being moved uh, either before the start of the season or in season? I think there's a likely chance that maybe Arvidsson be moved, but it would be quite shocked if Moore or Roy will be moved. So uh, definitely interesting to see there. As for uh, the Carolina Hurricanes, after the signing of Ajo, do you think there's a very likely chance that a guy like Brett Pesci on the defensive end or Tivo Teravai on the offensive end were to be moved at some point? And if they could be moved, do you think it will really improve their team if they could move one of those two guys out and bring in a solid top six winger to help with that team? Maybe a game breaker like they really need over the past couple of years. Definitely. Going to be interested to see, but I'd love to hear what you think down in the comments. And definitely tell me your thoughts on all that was discussed today. So that's all I'm going to talk about for today. Remember to like this video and if you like to remember to subscribe down below. I also do a blog talking about news, rumors, analysis, stuff like that. So definitely check that out. I'll leave a link down in the description below. And I can't wait to see you guys all for the next video. See you guys soon.